Here is one of a series of talks by spiritual leader Lola McDowell Lee, spanning two decades from the early 70s through the 90s. Lola was a Zen Roshi, whose Rinzai lineage included Dr. Henry Plutov and renowned Zen master Shigetsu Sasaki. Lola was a religious scholar as well as an ordained Christian minister. While the talks are focused mainly on Zen and Buddhism, Lola drew on many spiritual traditions, including those of Jesus, Plato, Lao Tzu, the Hindu Vedas, Meister Eckhart, and Gurdjieff. We eat, sleep, get up. This is our world. All we have to do after that is die. I shan't die. I shan't go anywhere. I'll be here. But don't ask me anything. I won't answer. Whatsoever it may be, it is all part of the world of illusion. Death itself not being a real thing. Should you wish to know the way in both this world and the other, ask a man of mercy and sincerity. And that's what E.Q. wrote. Now, E.Q. was uh, the uh, abbot of uh, Daitokoji in Kyoto at one time. He lived, uh, he was born around 1390-something, and he died in 1480-something. And it was he that taught the tea ceremony to his disciple, Shuko. And through Shuko, uh, it became known as a tea cult, or as they called it, or as they do still call it there, the cha no yu, cha meaning tea, cha no yu. Uh, you know, it is a strange thing. People have made a comparison. You know, tea for the Orient, and they use this tea ceremony and it's uh, for Christianity, it's wine. You know, on Sunday morning, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the Catholic Church and in the Lutheran Church and in the Episcopalian Church, the Anglican Church, you know, everybody drinks a little wine. And so the minister drinks with them. <laughs> anyway, Oh, does that one come out pretty looped? <laughs> that Sunday morning. But in the Orient, it's tea. The tea ceremony. Mm -hmm. So it's wine for Christianity and tea for the Zenists. Yeah. And now, we also, now EQ, you know, being what he was, a very famous Roshi. Uh, and he would say things to this Shuko. Uh, to the effect now, you know, the purpose of a teacher. You know, what, why, do, why do I need a teacher? But, you know, <laughs> well, you go to a teacher and you ask questions and you get a lot of information, you think. Hmm? Well, uh, actually, a teacher is not supposed to inform you about a lot of things. Not in this type of thing, No. The purpose of a teacher is to try to bring about a transformation. See, it's, it's a, to try to bring about a radical change in consciousness so that instead of looking this way with blinders, you're looking... Hmm? Yeah. So that the change comes from the very roots of yourself and not just in your head. So that you have a new way of looking at things. You, you, you've got new ears. You bring new ears to the world. 
You, you've got new clarity in what you see. So this is not information then, is it? No. But it is, a teacher's purpose is enlightenment. Huh? And through the process from where you are now, however near or far, from where you are now, to this realization of yourself as an enlightened consciousness, you will educate yourself. You will inform yourself. You will have taste tea. Huh? Yeah. So some of the questions that you ask, I don't answer in the way you want answered. Let's say, put it that way. The questions are not always answered in the way you would like to have them answered. Because a teacher doesn't address the question. The teacher addresses you, regardless of the question. Because in that way, all questions are the same. You know, it's like this um, little monk who went to his teacher, who happened to be the master, Pai Cheng, you know. And he said to him, well, you know, he asked him, who's the Buddha? And Pai Cheng said to him, who are you? Hmm? We think it's a turning around of a question. Yeah? But it does turn the mind in a different direction. If Pai Chang had answered, well, the Buddha is Gautama Siddhartha, or he's Shakyamuni, he would have been in error. It would have been a false answer. Buddha is more... Well, we people in Orthodox Buddhism, they think of Buddha as as uh, the man who realized, and it's based pretty much on the Buddha as a man who realized. Well, the Buddha is more than that. Hmm. I mean, you know, in Christianity, uh, the, the thing is based on on Jesus, but the Christ is more than Jesus. Hmm. Hmm? <laughs> well, anyway. Pai Chang, as a teacher, was not interested in history. He isn't concerned with a person called Gautama. He is concerned with a particular awakening that can happen to you. Hmm? Or we could say in you, because after all, you're the vessel. You are also the awakening. So he turns the question to the questioner himself, because in the questioner lies the answer. So he makes a sword, as it were, of the question. And that sword, you know, it pierces the heart. And the answer comes out. Hmm? So this, this, Pai Chang says, you know, who are you? Don't ask me about a Buddha of the past. Just ask one question. Who am I? And then you will know what the Buddha is. There's no need to look outside of yourself. Lao Tzu, you know, the Chinese philosopher, the old sage, he said to the effect, you know, to find the truth, you need not go out of your room. One need not even open the door. One need not even open his eyes. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. 
You know why he said that? Because truth is your very being. And to know the being, to know the truth, is Buddhahood. Anyway, this EQ said, we come into this world alone and we depart alone. Now watch your mind. Watch, you know, where it goes, how it turns wheels and everything else. It has a thousand and one ways of escaping. How to forget that I am alone. I wonder if you know how much time you spend with something like that. I mean, how well do you know yourself? You know? We avoid aloneness. We sit in a room and it's dark. And if you find yourself sitting in a dark room all by yourself, are you all of a sudden afraid of ghosts? <laughs> huh? Well, now we know that ghosts are projections. You're afraid of your aloneness, and that becomes the ghost. Then you're no longer alone. You may be frightened to death, but you're not alone. (laughs) Huh? So how now, sitting in your room all alone, like Lao Tzu says, I don't know that people can do that, huh? But so let's say you're sitting there, you know, And suddenly you look at these projections and you see that they are projections finally. See? And so suddenly maybe you see this emptiness. You've been shouting and shouting and yelling, you know, and no one hears. They're all doing the same thing. And you grope around in the dark sitting there and there's no hand that comes and grasps and says, it's all right, kid. Because if some hand did grasp you, <laughs> oh, <I can't. laughs> no. but you know this kind of aloneness. You know it does have to be accepted. You can't avoid. It. Well, some people avoid it forever. Yeah, but what good does it do you to avoid it? If one is alone, so what? I mean, really, so what? You know. You know, and I'm forever going on about your world. You know, everything that you see and taste and touch and hear and smell, it's your world. You think and feel. That's all your world, huh? You live in your world. You're clinging to your world. You're attached to your world. Now, really look very closely at your world. Maybe a great deal of it is a device so that you can escape from yourself. Not a nice thought, huh? No, 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 no. But you know, it takes a kind of a courage to face yourself. And it takes a kind of a courage to face your teacher. Any of them. You know what I mean? I mean, say, supposing now that Gautama... Uh, the Buddha were here, and you were to go in there with him. I wonder, maybe the room would be empty, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or say even Kogetsu Roshi were here. Well, David has faced him, so that can't be too bad. (laughs) I mean, it's, 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 (laughs) it's passable somehow or another, and Bob has faced Uh, Henry Plotoff, so that can't be all that (laughs) stringent. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, it does take courage. It just simply does. And if, if the Buddha were sitting here suddenly and you had to go in there with him, what would you do? I mean, really, what would you do? You know, we would say, yeah, if he would to walk in this room, I've got some questions I want to ask him. <laughs> yeah? 
You can all think of a question you'd like to ask, huh? Yeah. But to sit with, you know, in an aloneness, you know, I don't really want to do that. With a Buddha, with Lao Tzu, no. Because these are people, or even the Christ, you know, these are, these are the ones who are not going to allow you the luxury of an untruth or the comfort of lying to yourself or the convenience of this living in our illusions. Hmm? They're not going to allow it. They push, you know. You're alone. Look at it. You know. Aloneness is very fundamental. Meditation is very fundamental. And if you're actually sitting in meditation, you're alone. And it is a fundamental state. But then along comes this, this little EQ, this abbot of so long ago, and he says meditation <clears throat> and alone, <clears throat> this also is illusion. Yeah? I will teach you the way not to come, not to go. See, that's good Zen. It's a complete turnaround. Yeah? <clears throat> now, ordinarily, in our world, uh, we have uh, the concept, we're going to fall in love. Falling in love is togetherness. There is the possibility of being lost in each other. There is the possibility of communication, finally. And there is the possibility of really relating with someone. And then when it all falls apart, then you begin to move toward this being alone. And let us say at this place, there are people who pick up this meditation thing. You know, because meditation is the art of being alone. Of course, I do realize that some people, when they sit for meditation, um, they're sitting there and they're waiting for uh, the Buddha or the Christ or Lao Tzu or their concept of God being a person. They're waiting for some such thing to come to them, you know, and because then they would no longer be alone. Yeah? And I would say to these people, but you are not yet in meditation. No. They're sitting there in a world of waiting, in their world. Yeah? <clears throat> Few people go on to a world of meditation. And this man, this EQ, he says, if you cling to your world of your aloneness, you're still very far away from the truth. Yeah. Because it is still a clinging. Oh, look, I am alone. I am coping with my alone. I am alone. That's still not meditation. It is a world of clinging. You're clear clinging to your world, to a concept of alone. You know, we, we live kind of topsy-turvy, you know, we teeter-totterish, I guess I should say. You know, over here we have alone, and here we have uh, love, we call it, you know, and we swing from one to the other. And when one is rising, well, it's what's true. And when the other is rising, then it's what's true. Hmm? Mm -mm. That's a couple of weeks ago with the swan. Huh? But now say, let us say that this hand then represents the light and this hand represents the dark. And so people sit in the, in the, in the dark looking for the light. The dark is false and this is, you know, but if the dark is false, how can the light be true? Oh, I could say, you know, if, if pain is false 
and people do say that pain is false, then how can happiness be true? Huh? If birth is false, then how, de how can death be true? You know? Or vice versa. And if thou, which is all other, thou, if thou is false, then how can I be true? Hmm? Hmm. Okay, now let's say, for instance, and we've all been here, we fall in love. That's the only one who hasn't been there yet. That's crying. <laughs> and you'll get there. <clears throat> Poor little kid. <laughs> let's say you fall in love. You're in love now. This is nice. And there's all this nice togetherness. Huh? It's so together that pretty soon, sooner or later in there, you begin to have this need for your own space. <laughs> huh? You, you, there, there comes a need that you really would like to be alone a little bit. Most people don't acknowledge this because that would be, I would be a traitor, and wouldn't I? No. But all this togetherness and there rises in a kind of a need, let us say, for meditation. <clears throat> now, if you can see this, hmm, you can swim through the whole thing. Most people don't see this. They get a divorce instead. Hmm? They don't, don't see that they need a little space in there. Yeah. So they get a divorce instead, and then they go around the wheel again, and again, and again, and again, yeah? <clears throat> so we could say that all this togetherness kind of creates a need to be alone. To be alone creates a need to be in love, you know, for some togetherness. They're partners, yeah? And there are people, though, that try to escape this kind of thing. Uh, they, they isolate themselves when this need for space arises. They don't know that they've got space in here that they can just stand in. Yeah. And then there are the others who chase around and say, well, I'm living the good life. I'm having togetherness with lots of togethers. You know, you've just chosen one end of the stick, one of the polarities, haven't you? That's all. Yeah. Now, in the Hindu scriptures, <clears throat> there are stories about people meditating in the mountains, and they're sitting there and supposedly very deep in meditation, and suddenly one day they're surrounded by all these beautiful women from heaven who have come to distract them. See, they're meditating so good <laughs> that here come all these beautiful women to distract, to distract them. You know, they see these, these visions, you know. Because you know, I would like to ask them once, why should all these beautiful women from heaven be interested in distracting all these poor folk who are trying to meditate, you know? <laughs> For what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, for what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but nobody comes, really, you know. It's projection. It's hallucination. are very strange. <laughs> you don't like them? Oh no, they're just cute. 
They're off the wall. They're you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, we have a need to create what we haven't got, seemingly. Huh? We dream about all the things that we desire. And we figure out a way here and there to try to get what we dream about. And the strange part about it is that we also act on what we dream about. We don't act on good common sense. We have this dream, and we act out of that. And then we wonder why our world falls apart. Yeah. So if you're alone, why you create all these beautiful naked dancing women around you, huh? It's a form of escape from yourself, not from the meditation. From yourself. Huh? Now, this EQ, he says, the truth is that one has to go beyond both what we call love in this instance and this meditation. When togetherness and aloneness have disappeared, huh? what's left? When togetherness and aloneness have disappeared, what's left? You're neither alone and you're not together. What's left? And then he says, I will teach you the way not to come, not to go. <clears throat> After all, if aloneness and togetherness are gone, then there's nothing left, is there, you think? Huh? And if nothing is left, where are you going to go? Who is going to go? Huh? And going where? No one going nowhere. <laughs> No one going nowhere. What is, when there's no togetherness and aloneness, what is, is eternal. What is called in India sometimes the Advaitya, the non-dualistic wisdom. Now, the Buddha, he did speak of this tendency to be either in love or the desire to be alone. And he, you know, as he spoke of them as being two ends of the same stick. And he also said of it as he called it the disposition of the ego to remain. The disposition of the ego to remain. Our tendency, and look at it, our tendency to treat the ego as an absolute. Do you think the ego is an absolute? Think about it now. This absolute ego is, that's how you have it in your head in here. This absolute I, hmm, ego. Supposing it is not absolute, but it is a gap. It is a gap between you and totality. Here's you, here's the ego, here's totality. How are you going to bring you together with the totality with the ego sitting there in the middle? Hmm? Because of this thing sitting here in the middle, you know, that doesn't allow this, you know, man isn't in his right relationship with himself. It is a kind of, we could call it a gap of non-awareness. 
We move into a relationship that we call love. We move into it in non-awareness, in this ego thing. Huh? We move into meditation in a kind of a non-awareness. It's the ego that moves into it, huh? You take another little step, just another little step, go over that little gap, huh? And what you call love will disappear. But another kind of love rises. It is a, a non-personal, let us say, love. Uh, it is, well, we could call it compassion, if you will. The Greeks call it agape. I, you know, it doesn't matter what you call it. There is this something else that rises that is a tremendous caring. One should at least be able to sit in meditation until one has a kind of a taste of it or an inkling of it. You know, something that will come in and say, mm, you know. When meditation disappears, a totally different kind of meditativeness rises. You know, cultivated meditation is an effort. It's a practice. It is a cultivation. Yeah. But when this effort is dropped, then the meditative quality rises. And you're silent. Not that you're trying to be silent. You're not making any effort to remain tranquil. No, you're simply tranquil. You, I say. What you, then, is quiet and silent? No. The ego is not there. You know, you've jumped the gap. So there's no disturbance. Hmm? You know, if you're sitting there trying to be quiet and trying to be silent, I'm going to shut up here, you know, really you're split. You're divided. Here's this part over here saying to the other part of you, no, no, shut up. <laughs> you know, be quiet. I've got to be silent, you know. And here you're pummeling and pushing and, you know, shh. And what have you got? A conflict. But you're sitting there, and you're sitting there, so you call it meditation. But I would like to ask you, how can conflict be meditation? It isn't. No. You follow me. You've all been there where you've tried to pummel yourself into shutting up. No? That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> The eyes went, mm, so I, you know, that's why I could say that. When the true man of no rank, you know him? You know, I think it was Rinzai that was speaking to the assembly of monks one time, and he says, all you beginners, this true man of no rank is always going in and out of the gates of your face. Now show me this true man. Huh? Yeah. When the true man of no rank rises, that's the original man, huh? Yeah. There's no effort to be anything. It's just simply what it is. Huh? And this is the natural man of Zen. Yeah. He loves not because he needs someone to love, but because he can't help it. There is just all this caring. And he is meditative, not because he sits there and meditates, you know, but he is meditative because there is no disturbance in him. There's not this chaotic mishmashing around, huh? The split is no more. You know, the shield that we have, this is what we call ego, it's a shield, huh? Uh, it's all swallowed in the meditation. Hmm? This gap. Are you collected? 
and he's calm and he's integrated and whatever happens happens spontaneously and this is why the Zen people don't call it a spiritual man they call it a natural man he is neither worldly nor spiritual he is in the world but not of it huh he lives in the marketplace but the marketplace doesn't live in him do you hmm. we eat we sleep and we get up this is our world all we have to do after that is die well this is normally what we're about if you take a quick look at it <laughs> the circle of our lifespan we get up and we eat and we go to bed and we get up and we eat and we do a few little thinkings in between and a few little other odds and ends like take a bath and so on and you know we move in this way day in and day out and day in and day out and year in and year out and year in and year out and year in and year out and what else is there to do after that but die hmm some little talk you know very repetitive little gossip now and then lots of gossip now and then <laughs> yeah eating and sleeping and dying you know it's like in the thing that Carl Jung wrote when he went to Africa and he saw he walked over to the hill and he saw all these cattle moving and eating and dying you know and he said it was in all in this tremendous silence like he was the first man who had ever seen creation I'll dig that thing out and read it to you again someday. It's, it's really quite something how he could be objective and all these animals were just... Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. A little talk of me and thee. Hmm? You know, the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam there's two outstanding little verses in it there was a door to which I found no key there was a veil through which I could not see some little talk a while of me and thee there was and then no more of me and thee Then of the thee in me who works behind the veil, I lifted up my hands to find a lamp amid the darkness, and I heard as from without the me within thee blind. You know, that's something I think that maybe you take with you and, and uh, <clears throat> think about now and then, you know, this me and thee and the veil and the door that doesn't have a key. So, you know, Zen has their koan, you know, and these gateless gates, the doors, the entrances they speak of. You know, and me and thee, and then no more me and thee, what could that mean? And me within thee blind? Yeah. <clears throat> well, anyway, eating and sleeping and uh, going about our business and talking and, you know, getting up and going to bed. Well, this is even what an enlightened person does, huh? Well, I mean, after all, the Buddha was enlightened, and for 49 years after that, he went around teaching, so he must have gotten up in the morning, he must have eaten, and he must have gone to bed at night, plus all the other things that go on in there. No? You know, we don't hear of him not sleeping. The only the Mahatmas and the Himalayans do that. <laughs> yeah. Do not eat, 
not go to the bathroom, not get up. Well, what did Ikyu do? He got up, he went to the bathroom, he ate, and he went to bed. Yeah? Doing the same thing, but with a difference. Yeah? <clears throat> and this difference is what is to be understood. Yeah? So a Zen man lives like everybody else. <clears throat> so in a manner of speaking, there's no distinction. You work and you eat. After all, this is the thing. No work, no eat. Yeah? <clears throat> now, a Jain monk, I understand, lives a little differently than this. He eats, he sleeps, and he gets up. But he has a special way of eating. He can't use an ordinary toilet. He has to go outside of town. Yeah. He can't use an ordinary toilet because he's not an ordinary human being. He's a Jain. Yeah. He eats once a day, standing up. He never takes a bath. He never dresses. <coughs> no. They don't. They run around naked. <coughs> yeah. Now, all of this is conditioning. No. You know, whether you have to go outside the town to use a toilet or you can use an ordinary toilet that everybody else uses, well, you know, what difference does it make? You know, whether you eat twice a day or three times a day or five times a day or six times a day, what difference does it make? Except to how much girth you're going to have. Yeah? You know, all these little habits that we cultivate. <clears throat> there are tribes in Africa, they eat once every 24 hours. They've eaten that way for centuries. Once is enough. If they did anything different, they would be creating the illusion that I'm special. See, they would be going on ego trips. So a good Zen man lives very simply as you do. Yeah? I should say it lives as ordinarily, ordinary as you try to live. <laughs> yeah. Difference? Difference. A diff difficult difference to see. A good Zen man is witnessing what he's observing. <clears throat> when he eats, the universe eats with him. There is this inside difference. Huh? <clears throat> you may not be able to see it, but I think you can. You know, if you watch a Zen man walk, a good Zen man, you watch him walk, you know, he walks and he eats. Yeah? And he sleeps because, you know, the light of consciousness doesn't go out altogether. There's still something watching. See? He's different. A good Zen man lives as ordinarily as we do, but his ordinarily ordinariness is not ordinary. See? Rinzai Zen, Rinzai, way back a long time ago, he said once, all brethren in the way. I mean, we are all brethren in the way. You must know that there is in the reality of Buddhas nothing extraordinary for you to perform. You just live as usual without even trying to do anything in particular, attending to your natural wants, putting on clothes, eating meals, and lying down when you feel tired. And he said, let the ignorant people laugh at me. The wise know what I mean to say. That's good old Rinzai, huh? Yeah. And you all, most of you remember when Shuhu san was here, you know. And there were people in the <laughs> Sandys that were aghast. Here's this monk with the flapping robes out there, doo, 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 doo. <laughs> dancing, huh? Yeah. He didn't feel special in any way. He had a lot of strength. Yeah. You're not remaining the witness. It'll change your whole life. Now this EQ goes on to say, I shan't die. I shan't go anywhere. I'll be here. But don't ask me anything. I shan't answer. No. 
You know, when uh, Ramana Maharshi was dying, one of his disciples asked him, when you're dead, where will you go? Huh? And he opened his eyes and he looked and he says, where can I go? I will be here. Huh? Oh, where is here? Yeah. If you look at yourself through the eyes of your ego, you're there. Where is here? What is here? And he says, I shan't die. On the first place I was never born. I will be here, where I've always been. I have always been here. There is no coming and there is no going. It's only the birth and the death of the ego. You know, there's a lot of people who profess a belief in reincarnation. And they have an incorrect point of view of it. You know, they say to themselves, well, here I've done all this in this lifetime, and I look back, and it seems to me like it was kind of a waste in some ways. So next time, I would like to be this, or I would like to be that, or I would like to be the other thing. And uh, I also, when I was here before, I must have been this, usually quite a celebrity, <laughs> or <laughs> this, or that, or the other thing. And what I was then is what has created me as I am now. Never mind the genes and the chromosomes from the parents, you know. <clears throat> and these people never seem to ask, what about the witness? What about the light within that goes on and on and on and on? Huh? It is the witness that neither comes nor goes. It is always here. I shan't die. Just don't ask me any questions. I shan't answer. Right. Somewhere in this thing, as you're going along in this process, somehow you've got to learn to look at your ideas, at your notions. They create your life. You're manufacturing most of your life. Out of some usually silly notion. You, somebody thinks, well, they're a failure. They're not making anything out of their life. Well, he's not going to, such a person already thinking that he's a failure isn't going to make anything out of his life because he has said, accepted the notion that he's a failure. And there, there's somebody that says, well, I'm alone all the time and I can't find anybody to be friends with. Well, such a person usually has created a wall around himself and he's not available to be friends with. So you learn to witness yourself and what you're doing to yourself. With yourself, to yourself. You are constantly creating your life. Every day, every day, every day. You're manufacturing it. If you're not happy with it, look up here. Huh? Here's where you start dreaming you know, and then trying to act out the dream with no factualities. You know, you know tribes in, in Pakistan, you know, they're on the border of Kashmir. That's where the Hunzas live. And they live long, long lives. They live to be 100. 100 is still pretty young. 120, 150. Yeah, you know, we've all heard about them. This is changing. They have come in contact with other cultures. And now they've started dying earlier. Yeah? The food is the same. The climate is the same. But they know that other people die sooner. And maybe they feel a little bit guilty. Yeah? After all, you know, one has got to follow the crowd. Somehow it says in here, otherwise I'm guilty. Dumb, huh? Bernard Shaw, you know, he lived to be a ripe old age. What was he, 95? Something like that. When he was 50, he started looking for a place to live. And he went to all these little towns. And he went directly to the cemeteries. And he would read the tombstones. 
you know. <laughs> and he found a place where people lived a long, long time. You know, 90, 95, 105 years, 110. And he said, this is the place to live. And there was a tombstone there in this graveyard, and it, the man had lived to be 100, and it had written on it, this man died untimely. <laughs> this is the place to live. He, and he did. He moved there, and he lived to be a ripe old age along with everybody else. Huh? We follow the crowd. Yeah. That's not all we do with our heads. Now, E.Q., he called his approach to life and birth and death the medicine of the unborn undying. Should you wish to know the way in both this world and that other, because we do have them split in our heads, ask a man of mercy and sincerity. See, then, then, then now is the time to ask. Ask uh, what device or devices to use on oneself. You know, where should I start? You know, well, meditation will help. You know, and how to get out of the effort of meditation into real meditation. Trusting life will help. Yeah. And when you're out of this meditation love and love and meditation, then love will happen and meditation will happen. And then they will not be these tiny little things that we have created, you know. They will be gifts of grace. We do remember... Jesus, you know, when he spoke to his disciples, he said, I have come into this world not to bring peace, but to bring a sword. And somehow we've got to go to work on ourselves with that sword. You know, all these religions, they talk about swords. Christianity has a sword, and, and Zen has the sword, the sword of Manjusri, the sort of, of wisdom, you know, you cut all the knots, you, you cut away until it's all gone. Your world as your excuse is all gone. Hmm? But this man of compassion and of mercy and sincerity, he said, I come to bring a sword. And then E.Q. trained his disciple for the tea ceremony. <coughs> Shoku. Hmm? And uh, which they call Cha no Yu. And this tea ceremony is, is uh, the samurai and Zen tea ceremony, flower arranging, and all that, hmm? all together. And the spirit that runs through it is, are the four elements, harmony, reverence, purity, and tranquility. Well, if you wanted to enumerate things about meditation, that's what you'd come up with, too, with these four elements, huh? Harmony, you're no longer split. You know, reverence, you have this awe for life, which, you know... This, this tremendous mystery that we are and that we live in, and the purity, the mind wiped clean, and the tranquility, this, this tremendous silence. These four elements are needed. And then, as they say, then it becomes the blending of heaven and earth. You know, heaven and earth. Hmm. Yeah. Such is a man of mercy and sincerity. And then he knows what Hiyaku said. Zen teaching consists in grasping the spirit by transcending form. 
It unfailingly reminds us of the fact that the world in which we live is a world of particular forms. It unfailingly reminds us that we live in a world of form, that the spirit itself expresses itself only by means of form. And the Zen teaching consists in grasping the spirit which transcends form. At the same time, it keeps pointing to the form because this is the world in which we live. Did you, you, you do have an inkling of what he's talking about? Zen teaching consists in grasping the spirit by transcending form. It unfailingly reminds us of the fact that the world in which we live is a world of particular forms. Yeah? All right so far? Yeah. And that the <coughs> spirit which transcends form, expresses itself only by means of form. That's the kicker, huh? Cha no you, huh? The tea ceremony is a form hmm, through which the four elements are shown. You have to be able to show them. Yeah? And then you will see sincerity. No, that's what EQ meant. And now, may the peace and the power that passeth all understanding hold us and keep us in the love of the Christed consciousness while we are seemingly separate one from another. And I thank you very much. If you find Lola's talks valuable, more will be posted in weeks to come.